Welcome back to uh, Reynolds Runabout with Jeffrey Reynolds. I uh, spent this last week doing a lot of messing around with wires. And when you do the electrical project on your boat, it takes a lot of thought, and I'll show you how I did that, and a lot of finger work in putting a lot of fittings and uh, connectors together so that you have a really nice working powerful electrical system that is waterproof and safe and should give you years of use without any issues. And this is how I did it. Before I physically start wiring the boat, I've placed all of the uh, materials that I'll be using on the boat project for wiring on my counter. So theoretically, at the end of this process, this counter will be empty because it'll be on the boat. Um, I started with, with a battery. I have a new battery box. So it'll be strapped down in the boat. Um, I've included things like custom battery cables that were just the right length and won't be too long, too short. I get all of these products mostly from the Anchor Marine uh, line th through Wholesale Marine. And uh, they custom cut the wire to length so you don't ex buy extra that you don't need. Um, I have some of my, like my bow light and uh, my stern light. I've got the wire already done. So all I have to do is string it through the lights and then connect it um, with butt um, joint uh, fi uh, fixtures for wiring. I'll have those and I'll show you how I do that. I've got a, um, my bilge pump switch will be up in the dashboard, but hidden. So it'll slide down when I'm using it for boating, but not during boat shows. So it won't be on slightly when you see it. I'm using a, uh, a modern single battery switch so I can turn the battery off and on when I'm done every day. I've got a nice bilge pump um, that I'll be using from Atwood. And then I always use uh, a fuse bus, which uses uh, blade fuses. And I'm going to put that in my rear hatch area so it'll be easy to uh, change fuses when I need to. I also use wire uh, labels. These are foam, so they won't chafe your wire, and it's really easy to fix something if that is on both ends of your wire leads, uh, up by the light, but also back by, um, you know, the fuse box. Um, I'm using 14 gauge um, to run in the boat, meaning I'm running my power to my switches in the dashboard with 14. And then when I get to the switches, I use 16. 16 uh, gauge wire goes from the switch to the light or switch to the bilge pump, you know, a lighter wire. I start with 14 and end up with 16 because when you run the power through the boat, you lose amperage over distance. So this will give me good amperage going to switches and then uh, ample enough uh, amperage into the light or the bilge pump um, or horns so that they effectively work. So I use um, waterproof um, eye, what do they call them, heat shrink ring terminal. I use ring terminals so you can screw them on to the switches and the fuses so that they don't come off. You can also use what they call a blade um, Blade, you no, know, it's the blade version of the, the terminal. You can use these too, and you notice these have little holes in them, and that allows you to make them secure as well. I might be using some of those, I'm not sure. I also use um, heat shrink, um, the, the connectors, so I put the wire in and then I crimp it. I don't tie and twist. Um, I use the crimping and then heat shrinking method with my um, heat gun so that they're secure. And then I give them a pull test. They're supposed to be rated at 15 pounds pull test, but if you just pull on it in your hand and see that it doesn't come out, it's obviously going to be okay. That's just so that there's not an accident on the boat where something maybe inadvertently hits that wire and then, you know, pulls it loose. So that's why how I'm going to do that. And I'll show you my next step. Another process that I use when I wire a boat is to use a whiteboard or a tablet of paper to write out every electrical fixture that I have on the boat. So on my boat, I've got a bow light, 
and I've got two horns, a stern light, a bilge pump, and then the motor. Those are my electrical draws off my system. So I number them, and then I go and I measure, you know, from the, from the fixture, meaning the bow light to the switch and the dash, and then I also measure the distance between the switch itself to the fuse block in the back of the boat, which will include a different size, but that'll be the 14 gauge wire. So the first measurement is always, you know, 16 gauge from the fixture to the switch on the dashboard or in the stern. And then I go ahead and then the second measurement is, you know, the 14 gauge. Some of them, like the horns, will share a common lead, I mean the power, and they will uh, they meet at the dashboard, so I don't have to do much there. They're a little bit different because one horn is a little bit farther than the switch than the other. The bow light and the stern light are sharing a switch in the dashboard, and that will then lead back to um, the stern light, and it'll, it'll have to come back up to the switch and then back. So that's a little bit different. Uh, again, they're sharing a feed, a power feed. The bilge pump will be on its own power lead and its own switch. And then the motor has its own internal um, lead, so I won't have to do that. that. That is connected right to the fuse block in the stern of the boat. And the connection is made through the cable that will run in the bilge. And then I set up my fuse bus, FB, shows how many I've got going on. I've got a six station fuse bus, so that'll work. And then I show my boat. Terrible drawing, I know. It shows on the starboard side of the boat, those are the power leads coming from the fuse bus all the way to the, most of it going to the front where it connects to the switch. And then the switches are going all back, except for the stern light, which, you know, comes forward. But they all, they both connect at the switch on the dash. And then they go back um, to where they need, including the bilge pump. Um, so that's how I keep it straight in my head, uh, using red and black, which are the wire colors I'm using. You can use different colors uh, depending on the service uh, that it provides. You can look that up. I've got a link in the comments section that shows um, the reading I did on the West Marine site about how to do this effectively and safely so that your boat um, runs well for years. Another thing I found while working on older boats is that you can't get these older horns to work most of the time. So what I've done, I did this before on a boat and I have done it several times since, is I buy horns, I get mine from Wholesale Marine, and you can buy these horns that are very stripped down and they're meant to be under the boat hull or the deck in the hull. You know, normally in today's design, you'd have a vent on the front that allows that sound to exit the boat hull, uh, you know, via this horn. And um, so what I've been doing is buying these inexpensive horns, and um, they usually come with a bracket like this. That would mount under the deck. I get rid of that. And then I don't need, per se, the horn part, you know, the bugle, or the trumpet. I get rid of that because my boat vintage horn already has that. So what I do is I take the old horn apart. Well, I start out when I take the new boat. So all I want is, you know, the sounding device. And I've got that. It's all ready to go, hooked up. Um, so I take the old, you know, the trumpet. And within these old horns is a set of old original uh, parts that would have made the sound the horn. I get rid of those because they obviously don't function anymore. That includes a, a plate that vibrates. And because the new horn I just bought has that plate as well. So I leave the paper gaskets in there with the new horn because that's important you leave those in there. There has to be a little bit of separation between the metal of the old and the new horn and especially the new horn. So I've got the, the new guts, I'll call them. And on this one, I had to widen the holes in the back. That allowed these different sized 
electrical connectors to uh, go through the hole. So what I do, I've got my trumpet part. So I put that gasket back on there and I have to make sure that I put, you know, the wiring to the back of the horn on this model anyways. So that is now essentially the sound is vibrating and coming out here. And then I need this back to obviously to hold the mechanism. So it's amazing that these backs and these new horns are almost perfect for each other. The smaller horns that I have, it's even more perfect fit. So what I do, I just did a little modification, you know, to get that screw hole through the top. I have got my wire connections showing. I've also got a hole that allows the wires to exit the horn and then go in the back of the horn. And then eventually, you know, I'll just hook up my wires. And then um, here's a completed one. I've got them all coiled up. This frame arch sits on the top and that's what the bell, I'll call it the bell, sits on perfectly. And it looks just like an original vintage horn from 1957. And of course you want to do this way before you get it all back together, but this is what it sounds like. And if you double that on my little boat, it's going to be quite, quite a presence on the lake. So I'll put the bell on here. I'll reattach it to this, um, this deck bracket that has to um, be inserted into the boat, attach the boat, and then I'll attach it to that. And then my wires, run discreetly down the back and through the decking and, and then they'll be connected. So that's one way to keep your vintage horns and still get modern Coast Guard approved sound because these are modern approved Coast Guard horns that I've been buying. I know that they're legal and I can never get those old ones to work. In as much uh, effort as I make, I can't ever get them to work well. So. I find this to be um, more economical on time, but it also it gives me the, the assurance that I've got a good safe horn on the boat that is tucked conveniently in nice uh, looking horn on the deck. So that's what I do. With the bell all rewired, I'm now ready to make the connection uh, fittings that will go on the the horn switch. You can buy these switches, uh, including the uh, light switch I'll be using um, in brass, and I always get them in brass. They're more corrosion resistant. I think they look more authentic, even though you won't be seeing the back of the switch. The chrome is really uh, appropriate for that time period, so that works really well. So this will go on the dashboard. And one of the, the hardest things to do on the small runabouts is having to get under the dashboard just to hook these up. So, and there's a, no other way to do it. It's installed when you connect it. So um, that's one of the, the only a couple things I've got to do under the dash. So that's not too bad. So what I do is I cut my wire. These are, this is 16 gauge and you can get 16 gauge, um, you know, ring connectors. And I always make sure that the wire is just enough to get into that uh, metal portion. And, you know, sometimes you gotta give it a twist. Make sure it fits in there correct. You wanna use the correct fittings. You don't wanna try to force it or have them too big. And then I use the crimp style versus tying them. So I get it in there and I crimp it as hard as it'll go. You give it the pull test, you know. And then I use a, um, Hair dryer. I use the Wagner hair dryer, and this will allow you to heat shrink your fitting. And you want to hold it out there a ways so it's not on your hand, but it'll it'll go pretty quick. And uh, just get it in there, and you can start to see it shrinking. Just keep turning it. And what you want to do is see that black or red wire uh, come through that translucent blue plastic. So it looks solid, and that way you know you've got a watertight connection. And always make sure you put your dryer back, or your paint stripper, I'm sorry, call it a hair dryer. You can use a hair dryer if it's hot enough. I use a, this paint stripper. Make 
make sure it's on a metal surface so nothing gets burned on your bench. And as you can see, the translucence in this blue is solid. And that means you've got a good watertight connection. And you also have a great non-pull away connection to your switches because that screw will go through there and then that will be very hard to disconnect. You'll probably have more issues down the line with a fuse before you will with a connection. Because the weakest point on any electrical um, connection are the ends, whether it's in your home or your car or your boat. If you get the ends correct, both on the switch side, the instrument side, and then on the fuse block, you should have no trouble. And as I go through the wiring process of the boat, I'll show you how I keep all the connections limited, meaning nothing in the middle of the, between the light or the horn and the switch and the switch and the fuse block. You never want to have breaks in there if you can avoid In addition to the um, fixed ends that will go on your switch, I have a situation where I've got both a bow light and a stern light that had to have new sockets and bulbs. And that only comes in a very short section. So what I have to do is add what they call a butt connector. And that's, you know, just a little guy. This is a 1614 uh, gauge. So I just slip it in there. Make sure you crimp it very tightly. I like to crimp versus twist. I think it's a little more secure. It's in the solder sleeve. It's pulled tight. Um, with these lights, it doesn't matter, red or black, because <laughs> there isn't a difference in their opinion. You will find one or the other. As long as you have a lead that's red and one's in, one is black, it doesn't matter with the light. So that one's a little bit smaller wire, so I have to be careful to make sure that crimp is secure. Give it a pull test, I'm happy with that. I then get out my Wagner heat gun, which allows me to shrink up these sleeves so that they're waterproof. This is a waterproof tinned connection. I used tinned marine wire for all of mine because it is more uh, corrosive resistant because of the water environment. You can use automotive, AME I think they call it. That's, that's great. Um, but I choose to use a waterproof version and a tin version so I have double protection against corrosion and water. And that's what you get. You get a nice, um, secure, soldered, crimped connection and then I waterproofed it by shrinking um, the ANCO um, butt connector. Now I'll move on to the other one, and then I'll add on my connectors for my switch. Yesterday I spent most of my day um, setting up the bilge pump connection, which is like a glorified three-way light switch. So I got that ready to go. And then I spent time creating the power and negative return to my dashboard, which will power my horn, lights, and to the back bilge pump. So I'll have a way to turn the bilge pump on manually uh, should I be in the front cockpit and something goes wrong in the back. So today's project is to put in the fuse block or bus, which will include all the fuses, which will allow me to easily get in here and fix either in the boat or on land. I will also put in the battery switch. I'm, a, I'm only gonna have one battery for weight and it'll be, uh, so I just turn the boat off literally uh, electrically so I don't have to worry about uh, accidental draws when I'm not using it. And again, I can quickly turn it on before I launch the boat or if something goes wrong, I can turn it off while in the boat by simply lifting the hatch. The battery will be right below the hatch and it'll be straddled by my gas tanks. So, and with proper ventilation, that shouldn't be a problem and sealed connections, which I'll use. So let's get to work. I have completed the rear electrical system area connections. 
we have the fuse bus or block, some people call it, that run to the lines on the front and then they return as grounds, completing the loop, which then is connected to the battery switch, which allows me to turn my system on and off, everything. And then, which leads to the battery, which is the source. I put the bilge pump on the table to do the testing just because it's, it's in the rear and it's easier. So this will be hidden under my dashboard. I go test it. Also allows me to override. If I'm in the cockpit in the front and we have a problem in the back and the auto flow or the float on this bilge pump does not work, then you go to manual override. I can do that. The other material, all of these lines will be in a plastic loop that I will put inside the gunnel. So then we have all of the instruments that will be on the deck and leading to the dashboard. So when I get done with the finishing job, I'll put all these final plugs or um, switches in. So we have our horn, which is quite nice. And then we have our, both our stern and our deck are up here so I can test it. That shows you that those work. Now I will disconnect the system um, at the switches in the front, and then I might leave it on the bus, but I could take it off now that they're all labeled. Probably take it off the bus, put all the wires in the loom on each side of the boat so you don't have a lot of wires on each side because of heat and chafing. Even though this is marine wire and I've tried to prevent any chafing points that I can, it's just good to spread the load around on both sides of the boat for heat and other issues that might come about. So I'm now going to take it apart. One of the things I've been doing on the last few restorations is when I get all my wiring done, I put it in what's called um, plastic tube or plastic loom. And it meets a couple of requirements. It helps you keep everything contained within one loom, and then you can run it on both sides of the boat. I run my positive down the starboard and then my negative down the port. Um, you shouldn't go over three wires thick. This is um, 12 gauge, so I don't want to go any more than that. A couple of reasons it could get warm if you do, because you're sending a lot of, you know, it's 12 volts, but it gets warm. And I also want to keep the chafing to um, a minimum. And if it's within the loom, the chafing takes place on the loom and not on the, uh, the leads. So I'll put them inside the um, loom and then I run it the whole length of this, um, this positive lead. And then I'll take it over to the boat and then I systematically put it in place with, again, these plastic loom sleeves. Um, they call them cable clamps, which is what they are. And what I do is I, I made a notch under my uh, gunnels next to where the running gear runs. I also have a notch for this loom. And then I can get it up under there. You can't see it. It's protected and it's out of the way. And if anything ever goes wrong, you go and just pull the loom, uh, the the clamps off or whatever you want to do and you can take it out quite quickly and find out what's wrong and the last thing about this loom uh, it's recommended by the american yachting council that it drain and what i do is i leave the um, open end or the slit down if something ever did get in there or humidity it would drain so it fills a couple good requirements it's not that much money i get i get it in uh there's a 50 foot loom. This is the half inch. You can get it in three quarter, one inch, and one quarter if you want. Um, so you, you choose the one that is best for your uh, cable needs. I also use it on my trailers. That's another way to protect the wires. That's always a problem with trailers is they're, they're chafing on that steel or the weather, the salt. 
Um, it's a great way to keep everything a little more protected. It looks really nice. It's clean. I think you can get them in different colors. I always choose black. So, so this is what I do. You take your wires and I tape them. And then when I, I just, the hard thing about this is the starting. So what you do is you just get going in the end. And then once it's in, you just pull. And what I'll do is I'll pull this wire, you know, the, the 14 feet that I have laid out. And then when I get to the end, I'm going to leave these out and I'll clip it. And then I'm going to tape this off so that they don't move within the loom because that's, again, chafing. And also this will leave these ends for um, up under the dashboard. So I'll be able to just grab this loom full of wire. I've got my labels on there, as you can see and I'll know exactly which ones go where. And on the opposite end at the fuse bus, that also is the case. It'll come right up through and stop at the fuse bus and I'll just have these um, separated and they can go onto the different um, places where I have to screw them in. Well, that completes the electrical process project for me. I'll uh, take some time now and put the clamps on these looms to keep them up under the gunnels and hidden and safe. And uh, I'll call the electrical work done for now. Once I get the boat all refinished with varnish, I'll go back and I'll put the hardware on and the lights and the bilge pump and switches on the deck just so that I can say that I'm done. And then um, that'll probably be very close to when the boat is done. So it's one of the last things you do and it's one of the last things I do. I am happy that I've got the looms ready to go and they'll be in the boat. So when I go to hook everything up in the end, it'll be quite easy. So that's it for this week. Thank you for tuning in. And I, if you liked it, please hit the like button and I will we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.